Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. I'm Jim Helmer and in this video we're going to look at section 3.4 which is the library of functions. They're also known as parent functions. Uh, in some circles I've even heard them referred to as mother functions, but you're going to want to watch that term, right? Now the library of functions are essentially our basic functions that we use to uh, see the behavior of more complicated functions. Well, the first thing we're going to look at is a linear function, something that we're very familiar with. Uh, and in function notation here, we have f of x equals mx plus b, where m is our slope and b is our y-intercept. And the domain of this function, well, our domain of a linear function is all real numbers. So we'll say from negative infinity to infinity. The range, well, we can see it goes down to infinity and up to infinity, so its range is from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, this, when it comes to a linear equation, it depends on what the slope is to determine whether the function is increasing or decreasing, as we discussed in the previous video. Now, in this example, we can see as we move from left to right, y is increasing. So this would be an increasing function. Well, that depends on the linear equation itself. It's increasing if the slope is greater than 0, if it's positive. It would be decreasing if the slope is less than 0. If the slope is negative, it's going to decrease from left to right. What happens when the slope is 0? Well, that's a special type of linear equation that we call the constant function f of x equals some number. And in this case, we call it b because that would be our y-intercept, 0b. So the intercept is 0b. And let's just assess this for a moment. If this was in mx plus b form, well, if my slope is 0, 0 times anything is 0. So we just write it as y equals a number, or in this case, f of x equals a number. Its domain is all real numbers, but its range is unique to a linear equation. And that is that its range is one steady value. There is no value above b for the y. There is no value below. It is just b. So our range is just the value b, a single value. This is also an even function. Our constant function is even because it's symmetric with y. What's on the right side is mirrored to what's on the left side. It doesn't matter if x is positive or negative. You get the same y value, hence being constant. So if b equals 0, well, that would put it right on the origin. We'd have a horizontal line at the origin. That is the definition of our x-axis, and we call that the 0 function because f of x equals 0. That is our x-axis. All right, well, let's look at one last one. And this is actually our library function for linear equations. We call it the identity function. Why is it called the identity function? Well, if we think about it, if we were to write this in uh, non-function notation, y equals x. Whatever value x is, it identifies what y is. x and y are the same value. Now, we, what we notice here is the slope is equal to 1. 1 times x plus 0 for our b. So our y-intercept, when x is 0, y is 0, it happens to be the origin. Our identity function passes through the origin. Its domain, just like most functions, is from, or linear functions, excuse me, is from negative infinity to positive infinity. Its range negative infinity to positive infinity, except in the case of a constant function. That's why this one is unique. Otherwise, this is our parent function. Most of them are going to behave as this one. We notice it's an odd function as well. Our identity linear equation is odd, because any point we have here, x, y, we have the point down here, negative x, negative y. It is uh, mirrored through the origin. Uh, and if we look at this, we notice the slope is 1. Well, that's a positive value. So this is an increasing function as well. So it's increasing from the interval from negative infinity to positive infinity because our slope is positive. All right, let's move on to the next set of library functions. The next one we're going to look at is the square function. It's also known as the quadratic 
function, and we see it's a parabola, f of x equals x squared. This is one of our library functions. And if, if you want to look at all the library functions in the back of your textbook on the very inside back cover, you'll see all these functions laid out and some of their behaviors. But looking at the square function, we notice the x and y intercepts are the same. In this case, it's the origin. Our domain, well, we can have any value of x in here, and we see that in the graph. So it's from negative infinity to positive infinity. Our range, however, is limited. It's not infinite. As we notice, for this particular library function, it's from 0 and including 0, because that is a point, to infinity. 0 to infinity. That's our range. Now, pieces of this function are decreasing, and other parts are increasing over certain intervals. So let's determine what those intervals are. Looking at our graph, as we approach 0 from the left, we see that this is decreasing in y. So from negative infinity up to 0, this function is decreasing. It's increasing from 0 to positive infinity as we go to the right. Now, if you recall from the previous video, it's neither increasing or decreasing at 0. That's our change. Now, this is also an even function, or it is an even function, because what we see on this side is mirrored on this side. It's symmetric with y. So it's an even function. The reason why these library functions are important to understand is, what if I had x to the fourth? Well, x to the fourth is going to have the same intercept, it's going to have the same domain and range, it's going to have the same interval of decreasing and increasing because it's also an even function. So our quadratic also helps us understand our higher order polynomials, our even ordered ones, x to the fourth or x to the sixth. All right, let's look at our cubed function, f of x equals x cubed. Well, the x and y intercept we can see is again the origin, which we'll see in most of our library functions. Its domain, I can put any value of x in here. So it's negative infinity to positive infinity. The range, however, is different than the uh, square function. We notice that this continues down to negative infinity and up to positive infinity for our y values. So its range is negative infinity to positive infinity. Now notice I didn't put decreasing here, only increasing. If we look at this function, as we come up to here, it's increasing. And as we get past its intercept here, it's still increasing. This function is always increasing. So the interval that it increases on is from negative infinity to infinity. The x values that it, the y is getting larger is all of them. And we see that this is an odd function. Well, that's a clue to it too, right? x cubed, 3 is an odd number, an odd power. So an odd function, we can see any value here is reflected through the origin here. So if I have x, y, I have negative x, negative y. So this is an odd function. Let's look at the square root function. The square root function, in ways, is similar to our square function. Uh, think of it as its reciprocal. We did discuss that in a previous video, turned on its side, but we don't have this bottom piece to it, because then it wouldn't be a function. We don't have that plus or minus. Essentially, all we have is the square root of x, which, because x must always be positive, so we don't have any imaginary values. And we'll see that when we do its domain and range. The x and y intercept, well, the x, y intercept is still the origin with most of our library functions. Its domain, well, there are no x values that are less than 0, because that makes it imaginary. So our domain is from 0 to positive infinity. Any positive number we can take the square root of. Its range, well, if we notice its lowest point is 0. And it does include that value, because that is a point on our graph. And this arrow, even though as it seems to level off here, it doesn't totally level off. It continues in an upward motion on for infinity. So our range is from 0 to positive infinity. This is an increasing function as well, just like the previous one. Because we only have this piece of it as it goes on, y is always going to be increasing. So 
it increases on our domain from 0 to infinity. Now again, notice <coughs> when I wrote this interval of in increasing here, I used a parenthesis, not a bracket, because we don't know what it's doing at 0 because there's no value uh, to the left of it here. So, and is this even or odd? Well, it's neither because there's no reflection across the y. There's no reflection through the origin. So this is neither even nor is it odd. Let's look at the cubed root function. Now this actually is the reciprocal of this, or yeah, the reciprocal of this function. We're taking the cubed root of x. Imagine taking this and flipping it on its side. Okay, and that's what we have here. We change the x and y. Now, <clears throat> if we look at this, if we want to determine its xy intercept, we can see that it's passing through the origin. Its domain, well, we can take the cube root of any number, positive or negative, because we have an odd index. So its domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity. Its range, well, as this gets more negative, it goes down for infinity. As this gets more positive, it gets a little bit bigger. So it continues from negative infinity to positive infinity. This is also an increasing function, just as the cube function was, because as we move here, y is getting bigger, y is getting bigger, y is getting bigger, as we continue on to infinity. <clears throat> so it's increasing over the entire interval. <clears throat> we notice this is also an odd function, because any value we have here is reflected through the origin to any value we have down here. All right, and one last uh, one on this board that we're going to look at is the reciprocal. Now the reciprocal function, we notice it never crosses the y. What makes this unique is f of x equals 1 over x, the reciprocal of x. That's why we call it the reciprocal function. This has a domain restriction. If we notice it doesn't cross the y-axis, it doesn't cross the x-axis, so there are no intercepts because x equal to 0 is not in our domain. So we, to write this interval out, I'm actually going to take it right here. It's going to be from negative infinity, this value out here, up to 0, but not including 0. And the union from 0 all the way to positive infinity. So that's writing it in interval notation. If we were using set notation, I could just say x not equal to 0, because that's the only domain restriction. I can't divide by 0. <clears throat> if we look at the range, well, is there a value of x that will make this equal to 0? No, because if I set this equal to 0 and multiply both sides, uh, I'd get 1 equals 0. Well, that doesn't make sense. That's because there is no y-intercept as, as well. So I'd say y never, or excuse me, x-intercept, y never equals 0. Uh, and we could write that in the same uh, notation. If we wanted to write it in interval notation, it'd be the same. All right, this is a decreasing function everywhere we look at, uh, except for where we don't have a piece of the graph at x equals 0. If we notice, as we move left to right, this is decreasing as we get infinitely close to 0. So it's decreasing, and I'll write this interval right here. It's decreasing from negative infinity up to 0. It's also decreasing if we start here and move left to right. We notice it's decreasing as we move left to right on that side of the 0. So we have two intervals where it's decreasing. Well, it's decreasing everywhere except for where we don't have a piece of the graph. There is no y-intercept. And this is an odd function as well, because any value I have here is reflected through the origin. So we can see that whether it's here and here or here and here, we can see that reflection through the origin, making this an odd function. All right, let's, uh, let's look at two more parent functions or library functions. The next one we're going to look at is an absolute value function. f of x equals the absolute value of x. Well, if we just assess what we know about absolute values, no matter what I put into an absolute value, its output will always be positive. So my y values in this case are always going to be positive, and we can see that in the graph. So we recognize 
that absolute value functions look like a V. The xy intercept, in this case, if we look, we can see, yep, it's right at the origin again. The domain of this function, I can take the absolute value of any real number. So from negative infinity to positive infinity is my domain. But if we look at the range, the lowest value of y, well, y must always be positive or 0. So it goes from 0 to positive infinity. Right? Our output must always be equal to or greater than 0 when it's an absolute value. If we notice this, it's very similar to our quadratic function because it decreases as we get closer to the y-axis. So from negative infinity to 0, and we do not include 0 because at this value it's not defined whether it's increasing or decreasing. It's increasing on the interval from 0 to infinity. We see this piece of it is increasing from 0 to infinity. <clears throat> we also notice, and I didn't write it here, but this is also an even function. Notice what's on the right-hand side is reflected to what's on the left-hand side. So it's symmetric with y, making this an even function as well. Now, the last uh, library function that we're going to look at in this video is the greatest integer function, also known as the floor function. What this basically says is for any value of x, it is going to be the greatest integer rounded. That's essentially what it comes down to is rounding. I've, uh, I've seen this applied in chemistry when we talk about electron orbitals. Maybe you're familiar with uh, something in chemistry. Maybe you've had chemistry before. But energy states, they stay at 1 no matter how much energy you put in, and then it just jumps to the next one. So that's kind of an application of a greatest integer function, where we look at the behavior of something. If we look here, the value of y stays constant as x increases until it gets to the next integer, at which point the y value jumps up. Now, if we look at the y-intercept, we can see, well, the y-intercept is the origin. But the x-intercept, well, if it stays this value for y until it gets to the next integer, it actually has an interval of intercepts. So it includes 0, and then it goes up to the next interval, or integer, excuse me, which would be 1, at which point it is now off of the x-axis, not intercepting anymore. If we look at the domain, well, in this type of function, and I should have wrote f of x equals, you might see it, int of x, or you might see this symbol here, which says this is the integer of x. The function is the integer, greatest integer of x. Its domain, while well, we can put in any value of x, they are all within our domain, but our range is the integers of y, any real integer. So we could write it using that same notation, just saying the integer of y. All right, now when we look at this function, even though it seems like it's increasing from left to right, and in a way it is, it's actually considered a constant function over its specified intervals. From this interval to this interval, it's constant. But then it changes and stays constant. And then it changes and stays constant until we get to the next integer. And that's what this indicates. If x is some value, y, as x increases until it gets to the very next interval, it remains constant. That's what this says. So let's say if this was 5, it includes 5 until it gets to 6, one more greater than that value. But it doesn't include it, because that's the point at which it would jump to the next integer. Let's kind of take this concept and look at it as a table of values here. If x is negative 2 in our graph, then our y value is negative 2. If x is negative 1.75, if we look at the graph, well, here's negative 1.75. It's still at negative 2, because we haven't reached the next integer yet. So it stays at this level. Once we get to the next integer, negative 1, now it changes to that negative 1. And it stays constant. Notice the 
values aren't changing here until we get to the next interval. That's what this is saying. It's constant over each interval in between integers. A lot of I words there, intervals and integers, right? All right, the next thing we're going to look at is piecewise functions. All right, <clears throat> if we look at a piecewise function, this is taking pieces of our library functions or some transformation of those functions. And it uh, mixes them up a little bit. It, basically, we're taking a piece of the function over an interval. If we look at this, this looks like a nice straight line over the interval from this value of x to this value of x. And that's essentially what this function notation says. f of x equals this piece of the function over this domain. It equals this piece of the function. Notice we have x squared. That's a parabola, but it's reflected down. And we can see that in red here over this interval of our domain. And then finally, the last piece, this blue piece right here, is a cubed fr function shifted up to uh, between the values of 2 and 4, this piece of our domain. When it comes to graphing something like this, if I was given this, I would say, OK, I'm going to start at negative 5 and only go up to negative 2 and plot the values for this piece. And I would get this area in black right here from negative 5 to negative 2. And notice, in our domain, these are less than or equal to signs, so it includes the values. And you'll notice I darken them in black, so you can see they are included, but they're a piece of this function. If I look at the next piece, this negative x squared, if I were to graph it on the interval from negative 2 to 2, notice it doesn't include the endpoints. This one's taken by the first piece. But this one's an open value. It's not included. That we have an open circle there. So I would graph this parabola just over the indicated interval. And then lastly, this is a cube function. So I would plot points from 2 up to 4, including those end values. And we can see, yep, where x is 2 and x is 4, these values are included. And the values in between are represented by this function. So I'd just graph it as if I was graphing three separate functions, but only graph it over these given intervals. So let's, let's do some assessment now that we have the graph and hopefully understand how it was graphed just one piece at a time, hence the name piecewise function. It's wise to graph it just one piece at a time. If we look at our domain, well, our domain is our lowest value of x to our highest value of x. We have negative 5 to negative 2, including that value. And then the values in between negative 2 to 2, and the value including 2 up to 4, and including 4. Essentially, our domain are, what are my x values? Well, if I put all these together, negative 5 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 4. There are no gaps in here, because there's a value of a function for any given value of x between negative 5 and 4 including those endpoints. If I wrote this in interval notation, it would be from negative 5 to 4, including the endpoints, because these endpoints are included, and there's no gaps where there is no piece of a graph. What about our range? Well, our range, we do the same thing. We say, what's the lowest value? Well, my lowest value here seems to be negative 3. And that happens in two locations, but this one is included, so that is the lowest, negative 3. And as we move up, we notice there's always a piece of the function somewhere on the graph as we move up, even when we get to here, because this value is positive 1. This value is also positive 1. So there's no gap in between them where I don't have a piece of a graph. And it goes up to this value right here, which looks to be uh, 3. So from negative 3, to positive 3, and including that value, because it is filled in, that would be our range. Now, if we're asked to assess some value of x for this function here, we have to use that domain to say, which piece of the function do I need to refer to? Well, here, f of negative 2, well, I have to go to my function and say, which one of these includes the value negative 2? It's not this one, because it's not included. 
This one does include negative 2. So I would evaluate the function for this piece. So I'm going to say negative, negative 2, minus 5. Oh, we don't need that. So this would be positive 2 minus 5 equals negative 3. So f of negative 2 equals negative 3, because I referred to the right piece according to its domain. Let's see, is the value negative 2, negative 3 on our graph? Well, here's negative 2, here's negative 3. It sure is. It's this value right here. f of 0, well, if I look at my domain, which one of them would contain the value 0? I can see this one right here, because 0 is between negative 2 and 2. So I'd evaluate it at that piece right there. Oh, I missed a little piece when I copied this down. It's actually negative x squared plus 1. f of 0, well, that's in this domain if I assess this. Negative 0 squared, well, 0 squared is 0, so minus 0 is still 0. Plus 1 is 1. So when x is 0, this, well, I suppose I should write it this way. When x is 0, the function evaluated at 0 equals 1. And then lastly, we have f of 2. So I assess that, and I say, hey, this one is the value that includes 2 within its domain. So I can plug 2 in and find the value. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. Negative 1 cubed is still negative 1. Negative 1 plus 2 is positive 1. So f of 2 equals 1. And we can see that this value, f of 2, does equal 1. All right, one last board. And it is your quiz for this video. And it's essentially doing a piecewise function. What you're asked to do is use this piecewise function, where x plus 3 over this domain, x less than negative 2, graph that piece of the function for values less than negative 2. And then graph, on the same graph, another piece of this linear function for x values greater than or equal to negative 2. So we're going to have two different pieces on our graph. And they're going to go maybe in different directions, because notice positive slope or negative slope. They're just linear equations. And then find the domain and range. Hopefully, you can just look at this and see the domain. But make sure you check the graph that you did. And hopefully, you check your work, and you find the correct range. So this has been section 3.4, library functions. Take the time to study those library functions at the back of your book. Get them to memory, because we're going to use them in the very next section, and we're going to use them frequently in this class. This has been section 3.4, library functions. Thank you for watching.